everybody good? Do you notice me saying some new and old stuff today? Yeah. In fact, one of the old ones you didn't know. <laughs> Did you know there in the, in the Adventist team book, I just looked, there's almost 700 hymns. I bet you we'd sing about 50 of them. But anyway, we introduced David Crowder to you, whether you didn't know it or not. Uh, uh, here's my heart, Lord. And then some of the older uh, songs and, and newer ones, and that's kind of going to be the mix. And so uh, we're going we're, we're to that. If you have, I hope you bring a Bible. One of our goals here is that people bring Bibles. It's okay to bring a Bible. Um, if you don't have a Bible, if you have an iPad and you have your scripture on the iPad, turn your iPad on. Just make sure the volume's down. And some of you have your scripture on your phone, which is a neat idea too. So turn on your phone. And you've never heard any pastor in the church say, turn on your phone. <laughs> so whatever you use to read the scripture, that's what you use. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow the screen. There is a Bible in the in underneath your seat, I think. It might be a little different uh, rendering of the English, but it'll be close enough. It, I'm sure you've heard this story. If not, you've read it because it was written by Max Lucado in his book, Gentle Thunder. But in either case, pretend like you're hearing it from me for the first time. This is what he writes. Some time ago, I came upon a fellow on a trip who was carrying a Bible. Are you a Christian? I asked him. Yes, he said excitedly. I have learned, however, that you can't be too careful. So I probed. Do you believe in the virgin birth? I accepted, was his reply. The deity of Jesus. Absolutely. Death of Christ on the cross. Yes. He died for all people. Could it be? that I was at last, face to face, with a true Christian. Nonetheless, I had to be sure. So I continued my checklist. Status of humankind, sinners in need of grace. Your definition of grace, God doing for mankind what mankind can't do for themselves. The return of Jesus Christ, soon. The Bible, God's Word. The church, the body of Christ. I started getting excited. My pulse began to raise. Conservative or liberal? <laughs> <laughs> he was getting interested too. Conservative. My heart was beating even faster. Heritage, I asked. Southern Congregationalist, Holy Son of God, Dispensationalist, Triune Convention. Mine, too! <laughs> what branch? Premillennial, post tribulational non charismatic King James Version, One Cup Communion. My eyes began to get teary. I had only one more question. Is your pulpit wooden or fiberglass? <laughs> fiberglass, he responded. I withdrew my hand and stiffened my neck. Heretic! And I walked away. It doesn't get better than that. <laughs> of course, the church history in America certainly is strewn with the wreckage of churches that were once alive and growing with all the correct ingredients, programs, ministries, people, money, but somehow lost sight of their true purposes, what was really important, instead became mired in fiberglass versus wooden. They became mired in petty and inconsequential things. And as a result of that, they either just imploded or became ingrown. And so what a lot of people thought was a great deal disappeared or morphed into something that really wasn't the church, in fact, very harmless. That might explain why today 81% of people in our country declare that they can arrive at their own religious views without any connection to a church. 81%. They've seen too many disasters, too many unhealthy models, so they say, hey, forget that. Who needs the church? And the first church, which I would call Christ Church Jerusalem, the first church of the New Testament, ran the same risks. The risks of not focusing on 
what was essential and becoming lost and what was not essential. But as the church began, as was read to us earlier, even as it began to kind of unpack who it was, it started to grow. And, and boy, did it grow. Look at two verses in your Bible for a moment. Acts chapter 1, verse 15, and then chapter uh, 2, verse 41. In those days, Peter stood, stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. That's it. Ten dozen people. Then, chapter 2, verse 41. So that those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. The first chapter of Acts begins with a description of the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven after his resurrection. And as that occurs, Christ leaves a fledgling startup church behind him. That church, 120 people, is the size of 80 to 85 percent of churches in America today. 120 adults. But then, according to Acts chapter 2, less than two months later, in response to the first public sermon preached by the Apostle Peter, this little startup group of 120 adults who don't know up from down has multiplied 26 times from 120 people to 3,120. <coughs> I don't care what you call that. That's, that's incredible explosive growth. And within the first five years of the early church, as accounted for in the book of Acts, the church grew to the size of 20,000 adults. We're talking about an incredible amount of growth in a very short period of time. But those numbers happen today, believe it or not. The latest numbers I've read for the People's Republic of China, where the church is underground and persecuted, there are 28,000 conversions to Jesus Christ every day. In South America, there are 10,000 conversions to Christ every single day. The Deeper Life Church in Lagos, Nigeria, where we've had tremendous uproar and tragedy recently, that church started out as a Bible study in 1974. It is now Africa's largest congregation. It has a Sunday worship attendance of 120,000. The members have started 500 other churches in their city, 5,000 in their country, and 3,000 in other countries. That's one new church plant for every 14 people who attend the church in a lot of us. But those numbers, generally speaking, are not true in the United States of America. Africa, South of Sahara, South America, China, the Philippines, <coughs> Korea. Today in our country, there are some 65 million people over the age of 18 who are unchurched. 65 million. That represents one third of the adult population of our country. The number of people in the United States who are not true followers of Jesus Christ is 190 million people. If that group were a nation unto itself, it would be the fourth most population, populated nation on this planet behind only China, India, and Indonesia. Some experts have gone as far as to suggest that the Spirit of God is sweeping over the world with the third wave of the Spirit, but with the exception of North America. That we, our country and Canada, are the point of exclusion along with parts of Western Europe, to this great movement of the Spirit of God. I'm reading a book called The American Church in Crisis. It's up to date. It has all kinds of statistics. I read this this morning. They, they charted regular participants in, an American church, in American churches. That is, a person who attends church three out of every eight Sundays or more than once a month. 23% of Americans are regular participants, which means 77% of Americans do not meet the definition. 77% of Americans do not have a consistent life-giving connection with the local church. Why is that? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons, I think, is that the church has no idea what it's doing. 
They've lost sight of their basic purposes, the essential ingredients of what God would have us be for health. That's why we're doing a series for the next several months on the New Testament church. And what is it that God has outlined for you? There are many places in our country where churches have just forgotten why they're supposed to be. And we, as a result, spend an inordinate amount of time and money uh, taking care of ourselves, making ourselves feel really comfortable and rolling along like we've done in the past. But in the process, we, we lose our passion for what is really biblically important. The early church, the first church, the Christ church in Jerusalem, at least for the first six, seven, or eight chapters of the book of Acts, was able to stay true to purpose. And, and St. Luke, Dr. Luke, the man who wrote the book of Acts, provides us with a description of their health plan. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and I want you to focus on this incredible glimpse he gives us of a spirit-filled, spirit-led church. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Now bear in mind, Christ Church Jerusalem was the church. If the sermon was too long, you had no option. <laughs> if the music wasn't right, you were stuck. There was no second church. There was nothing else. That was it. And without the benefit of Willow Creek and Saddleback hosting seminars and telling us how to do church, the first church had none of that. They had nothing. They had no history, no template, no seminars, no statements, no internet, none of that. Yet they were somehow able to, to focus their spiritual priorities by simply stopping and listening to the Spirit. And as a result, St. Luke says, look, at, he says in verse 42, they devoted themselves to certain priorities. That word devoted is a verb that means they gave constant attention to these things. It, it describes a single and, and steadfast faithfulness to certain priorities. And, and the fact that the word was used in other places in the Greek language to be persistently obstinate. Normally, we shouldn't be obstinate. But the church was persistently obstinate about certain things. And the word also means they spent a lot of time on this. This was a big deal. Are we... And along with them, going to be stubbornly obstinate about what is listed in this text. Whatever else they did was gravy compared to these priorities. They never wavered on these. Nothing and no one could sidetrack them from the bottom line core values. And the first of which is the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, that would have included that would include instruction from the First Testament or the Old Testament. That's what the, the apostles were raised on. It would have included teaching from the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ because they hung out with Jesus. Even though the Gospels weren't yet written at this time, they knew what Jesus taught and they passed that on. And, and then it would have included additional, newer teaching from themselves, the apostles. Now, as St. Peter preached the first sermon in the first church, I want you to remember, though, that his teaching focused on someone. As he talks about Jesus, he borrows from the Old Testament prophecy of Joel. He borrows from the Psalms that were written by David. And he borrows from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. He quotes Joel chapter 2. He quotes Psalm chapter 16. He quotes Psalm 132, and he quotes Isaiah chapter 57. He knew who we were the Lord. But don't lose sight of the focus of his emphasis and his quotations. In verse 22 of chapter 2 of Acts, Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. In verse 23, this Jesus. Verse 31, David spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. Verse 32, this Jesus, God raised up. Verse 36, God has made him both Lord and Christ this Jesus, whom you crucified. Verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Not the name of Allah, not the name of a Zen Buddhist, not the name of any other philosophy or religion, as, as appropriate as those may be for people who make choices other than Christianity. There is only one choice for those of us who follow the word of the Lord, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. 
That's what the church is designed to be about. It's not designed to be about anybody else. That's why in Peter's first sermon, there is this inordinate emphasis on the person of Christ. Christ must be our focus. Peter declared the gospel in his first sermon. He declared that Jesus died for our sins and was raised from the grave. He declared that Christ promises to those who respond in repentance to him both the forgiveness of their sins that wipes out their past and the gift of the Holy Spirit that helps you become a new person and allow you to be all that God designed you to be. Listen to me. The Christian church, no matter what our labels, has no liberty to amputate the gospel by proclaiming the cross without the resurrection. Referring to the New Testament, but not the Old Testament. Offering forgiveness without the Holy Spirit. Demanding faith without repentance. The responsibility of the church today is to collect, is to declare the Jesus of Acts chapter 2, or we are not the church. Whatever else we want to call ourselves, that's fine. But don't call yourselves the church. But now in verse 46, look at this. This is the incredible part of all of this as it came together. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. The teaching of the apostles was done most often in public worship services in the Jewish temple, the outer court of the temple where anyone was allowed to go. And look at what it says. They met there how often? Now I know we're, it, it's hard on Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, that's early. Unless you're golfing. I, I drove by a golf club today. They're, they're, they're lined up on the first tee box. It's a beautiful place. Some of you say, can we have an earlier service? And I, I hate to ask why, but I think I know. <laughs> they met every single day of the week. These new Christians, this is the first church. They sat at the apostles' feet, so hungry to hear the word of God, they were willing to show up every single day for biblical teaching. Before starting their day, working as slaves, they studied the scriptures in the outer courts of the temple. Ninety percent of the early church, slaves, they gathered in homes with other Christians every single night. They understood the importance of being devoted to biblical teaching. How important is biblical instruction in Christ's church? Very important. It is one of our core values. We will not teach Bible light. We will not uh, allow you to drift into studies that to have no bearing on scripture. We are here to help us be anchored in the word of the Lord. But Jordan Barnum, who is a pollster among Christians particularly, says that although 38% of the people in this country who were surveyed believe that the Bible was written uh, not too long after Jesus, within the first century, the same group, 44%, even more, believe that Jesus was imperfect and a sinner. Two-thirds of the people had no idea what John chapter 3, verse 16 was about. Ten percent of the respondents thought Noah's wife was named Joan of Arc. <laughs> and eighty percent of those who were surveyed claimed incorrectly that God helps those who help themselves is a biblical statement. I saw Jay Hooper. He doesn't? <laughs> That's like saying that a rolling stone gathers no moss is in Matthew chapter 6. It's not there. And that's why a large part of the ministry of Christ's church is geared to clear, practical teachings of the scripture. It's also the reason I don't apologize for teaching the Bible. It's the reason I still today spend a good portion of my week studying and preparing to preach here or to teach somewhere. Because years ago when I started out as a very young man of 22 years of age, I made a commitment and I made a decision to devote my life to studying and preparing and then preaching the word of the Lord, whatever the cost may be. But in order for biblical preaching and teaching to be effective, like the first church, we have to be and become hungry audience. 
The greatest, the greatest of preaching can be reduced to rubble if it's delivered to people who do not view the teaching of the word of the Lord as a priority for the church. It's my conviction and it's my experience that preaching and teaching the word of God must stand at the heart of the very life of the church. Because when the content of the word of God is faithfully declared, it will ultimately impact the life and the character of everyone who listens. It will not always be received, but it will impact you. And it will change the lives of those of us in the church who will receive it. It's the only diet that leads to spiritual health. That's the first priority. There's another one. And, 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 and Dr. Luke describes it in verse 42, and then just put that together in verse 45. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, in order for us to do that, what we've done is we've sent out a crew, Jeff organized this earlier, and there are a number of bar shows going on at your home right now as we speak. <laughs> so, when you get home, things may be a little different in our bars, but it's okay. It's okay. And We've taken care of everything. It's off the premises. <laughs> the word fellowship here describes an association or a community of people who are linked together tightly. And out of that linkage, that community identity, they interact with each other and they share with each other. Community or fellowship in the New Testament begins with a vertical connection with God the Father through faith in Jesus Christ, and then ends in a horizontal application. Consider the, the vertical emphasis of this community. In the first church, emerging from the day of Pentecost, the one thing that characterized these people was their connection by faith in Jesus Christ to God the Father through the Holy Spirit. And the bottom line, is that Christian community is based initially on what we have in common spiritually. The fellowship of the church is an experience with the Holy Trinity. It is our common sharing God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's like being members of the same family. These folks who gathered in that, that first day were from all parts of the world. If you were to read uh, in Acts chapter 2, the geography locations of the people, you would discover that they came from Cappadocia or, or the middle part of the land we now know as Turkey. Others of them came from Africa. What did these people have in common? The same zip code? Absolutely not. The same weather? No. What did they have in common? Jesus Christ. The most important basis for fellowship for Christ's church is the common denominator of Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Now, it's possible that not everyone is at that place today. And one of our goals over time is to get you to that place. And then for you to move into the lives of others is in witness and bring them into that same common fellowship or point of view. But, but look at how it got lived out after it was embraced. Verses 42 talk about the fellowship. In verse 44, they, have, they were together in all things in common. The word fellowship in the book of Acts specifies contributing or giving something for the benefit of somebody else. And fellowship in the first church always cost you something. In fact, the word fellowship or koinonia is related to the Greek word for generosity. And, and, and that's what's happening here. I mean, just think about what went on that, that, first, that first week. There are over 3,000 people who wandered into Jerusalem, many of whom had come from other parts of the world, and they were there to celebrate the Jewish festival called the Feast of Weeks. Most of them, up to that point, unless they came and traveled together, didn't know each other. But now over 3,000 of them are one in Christ. And what happens? They begin to share and to love with each other. They begin to share transparently without embarrassment. They identify needs without feeling weak. And people responded to their burden. They responded to their needs and reached out and helped them. I mean, that's an incredible thing. These are perfect strangers opening their lives to each other and watching as people they never knew before opened up 
their wallets. And as I, as I put that together this week, I just thought about last Sunday's offering. We, we hardly said a word about it. And you, the people of Christ's church, opened your wallets and just blew us away with your generosity. That's what a commitment, a point of need with Jesus would do for people because it's a countercultural kind of a thing. Our culture says, hoard what you have. Jesus says, give what you can. Teaching impacted their living. And that's the intended life of the church today. There, there has never been a time, I don't think, in our world where people need to be. The more we get high tech, the more we need high touch. And I have learned from my wife, I was at breakfast on Friday with a man, whom if I mentioned to, his name to you, most of you would know him. And I spent an hour and 15 minutes, and all I asked him was this question, tell me your story. I, I didn't tell anything about me. And uh, in fact, by the time he got finished his story, there wasn't any time. Not that it was necessary, but tell me your story. And whenever I'm gathered with men, one-on-one -on -one or in a group, one of the key things that I ask, well, do you have any family? And tell me a little bit about yourself. How long have you lived in Traverse City? Tell me your story. And over time, that story will sooner or later lead to pain in that person's life. And it will also lead to the subject of faith or the lack of it. And that's what's going on in this first church. Remember the, the, the program Cheers? Oh, remember, remember the how? Oh, yeah. It's not a condition to attending here not knowing about that. <laughs> how many of you remember Cheers and watched it and loved it? All right. Boy, tough crowd, tough crowd. But what was the song? What was the lyric in the song? Cheers was everybody seeking a place where everybody knows. Now we fool ourselves in the church. Here's how we do this. We, we, we like name tags. And uh, so we think that, well, if we have name tags in church, that's how we'll learn people's names. No, it isn't. That's how we'll learn to read name tags. <laughs> and if you've got good eyes, you can spot the person's name before they get to you. And then when they come to you, say, well, hello there. Look at this. <laughs> Verse 46. Do you know what it means when a pastor 
looks at his watch and then takes it off, puts it here, you know what that means? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes you feel better. <laughs> and day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor, watch, with all the people, not just the church people, and the Lord added to the number day by day those who were being saved. This is an absolutely amazing picture as they, as they feed on the Word of God and as they come to know Jesus by faith and as they connect with one another in community, then, then they also came together as times of worship and praise. Breaking the bread and the prayers, the sacrament of Holy Communion and prayer that goes forward throughout the day and in the service. And th that's, that's what they were involved in. I, I, I've sometimes been asked, if, if, if the prayer of the first church included the Lord's Prayer. And, and the answer is uh, probably not. Not at this stage because the Gospels hadn't been written down yet. And so they, they may have known the Lord's Prayer from some of the disciples, but they didn't, they didn't have the New Testament. Whatever they prayed, they, they, they prayed spontaneously. They prayed Old Testament Psalms. We don't know exactly what they prayed, but they were involved in prayer, in praying. And in fact, we know from the first manual of church order called the Didache that was written in 80 AD. We know that by 80 AD they were praying the Lord's Prayer because that little book, the Didache, recommended that Christians use the Lord's Prayer three times a day. Not just in church, three times a day they pray that prayer. But not at this point. They were just fledgling. There were no prayer seminars. There were no international houses of prayer to go and learn about. There was nothing like that. They just, on their own, they knew this is what we must do. They occurred in the context of the temple, and they occurred in homes as people went to one another's home. Verse 46 makes it really, really clear. They also celebrated communion in their homes, and community in their homes. And when you read about that, you know what you're reading about? Small groups. Somebody thinks that somebody thinks that small groups were an invention of a pastor who had lots of time on his hands. Small groups were part of the early New Testament. And we are committed to unfolding and unpacking small groups in our future as we continue to get organized and figure out what in the world we're doing. We want to have small groups. Small groups that will be devoted to the apostles' teaching and to worship. The apostles' teaching and to worship. And, and you'll notice here that uh, it says in verse 47, verse 46, they were praising God, Dr. Luke says. Dr. Luke uses the very same word praising to describe the first advent of angels and of shepherds. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. Praising includes words of praise and songs of praise. First church, Christ Church of Jerusalem, was a singing, praising church. And guess what? Are you ready for this? Pastor your seatbelts. Everything they sang was a new song. Everything they sang at the First Christ Church was a contemporary song. <laughs> you know, uh, Charles Wesley hadn't been born. <laughs> Fanny Crosby wasn't around. Ira Sankey was still light years away from being on this planet. They couldn't sing old songs. There were no Christian songs written to that point in history. All of their songs were brand new. In fact, everything the first church did was brand new. Nobody at Christ Church Jerusalem could say, I've well, never done it this way before. <laughs> because everything they did, they'd never done it that way before. They'd never done it. But the focus was not the style of music or the age category of the songs. The focus was on praising the future, as Pastor Jeff already said. We're going to be attempting to offer hymns with some age on them and some praises that have just been birthed. 
please, please, please. Don't let your personal preference trump the purpose of praise. Don't let your personal preference trump the purpose of our praise. And that is worshiping God. His preference is not style. His preference is praise. Christ Church, Jerusalem, worshiped through singing in corporate settings and in small group settings. And, and, and it was absolutely impactful. Do you know, it says that they had favor with all the people. I'm just going to I'm just going to tell you that that's a huge mark of joy. It's a huge mark of, of grace. It says here that, that they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Glad hearts. You know, I observed last Sunday here at Christ Church a significant issue right out of the gate. Everybody was smiling. <laughs> we can't keep that up. <laughs> I mean, some of them, we're going to drive some people away from church and say, well, that's not what my church is like. <laughs> so it's a big, just turn to the other person sitting beside you and try to look at them right now and not smile. Go ahead, I dare you. I go, go I dare you. See the problem? You see what I'm talking about? That's uh, joy and grace in people's hearts. And it says they have favor with all the people. You know what that means? People who are outside the church know this. You know, when a person comes to a Christ church for the first time, they'll notice how you sing. <coughs> well, they'll notice your smile or your laughter. And, and they may not know Jesus. And they may not know anything about church. But they will learn something as they stand beside you. Well, you say they'll learn that I'm a rotten singer. No, that's really not what they'll learn. They might be worse than you. What they'll learn is what your heart is feeling at that moment as you offer up praise to God. And, and, and it had an impact. And, and, and the Bible says here, and I'm done with this, that the Lord was adding to him daily, daily, daily. People were being saved. Now think about this. How did that happen? They have a big evangelistic crusade. No, they met at home, remember? They didn't have glass windows, so their windows were usually open. They're praying. They're sharing with one another. And God is doing signs and wonders and the Holy Spirit has shown up in miraculous ways. They begin to sing. They begin to praise. And the words of their mouth and the meditations of their hearts and the singing from their lips go out into the streets, those narrow streets of Jerusalem, if you've ever been there, and people are hearing this conversation about a, a man who died on a cross, who was raised again, ascended into heaven, is coming back. They heard about changes in their lives, transformations. They, they heard about needs being met and, and, and shortfalls being made up. They, heard about, they saw people smiling at one another. They heard them praying to this, to this unseen God with great joy in their hearts, and they heard these songs that they never heard before coming out of the windows of these houses, and it was so amazing and so powerful and so attractive, they wanted to go. And they did. And God says every single day, people will get saved as a result of that kind of church. Welcome to Christ Church. Fasten your seatbelts.